two months. <laughs> We've got two months until the first three episodes of Wheel of Time drop. And it is so weird. I feel like I've been waiting for literally half of my life to see this story adapted, but also that two months? That is so soon. It almost feels too soon. I don't know, it's a weird feeling. <laughs> but anyway, you clicked on this video because you saw the title, right? I'm going to be talking about plot holes in The Wheel of Time, at least the ones that I've noticed and care about. But before I go on, obviously, if I'm talking about plot holes, I'm also going to be talking about plot points. So, spoiler warning. I'm going to be hitting on some specific and some vague plot points that go through to the end of the series. So, if you haven't finished, I I'm sorry, I'm going to have to ask you to, to leave. But, you know, hit that like and subscribe button on your way out. Let's be nerdy, Let's be nerdy, let's be nerdy. Let's be nerdy, series as massive and as intricate as The Wheel of Time is, my list of plot holes is remarkably short. I've got five plot holes, or errors? I don't know, some of them don't, whatever, we'll get into the into them, but I've only got five on my list, and most of them are so minor that they're, they're almost barely worth noticing, but when you've read the series as many times as I have, and I literally just started another reread yesterday, you begin to notice things. You can't help it. And even the one on my list that I consider the biggest plot hole, I think I understand why it exists. And all right, well, we'll get to that later. First, let me tell you what inspired this video. It was the Wheel Weaves podcast. I've mentioned this podcast before, and I've actually had Danny and Brett on my channel. I'll link to that video in the description below. Their podcast is a first-time reader podcast. Brett is uh, the long-time reader, and his wife, Danny is going through the series for the first time. And it's a lot of fun. It's a great podcast. They are almost through the fires of heaven right now. I perhaps finished it by the time this video goes up. And the other day, while catching up on some uh, of their episodes that I had in my backlog, I was so satisfied to hear Danny talk about something that has bothered me for years. And I've never heard anyone else talk about it. It was so... It was so affirming, like, to know I'm not crazy, or at least that I'm not alone in being crazy, because I'm bothered by this plot hole. Okay, okay, plot hole might not be the right word. If you could tell me what the right word is for what I'm about to talk about, please let me know in the comments. But okay, here it is. In Fires of Heaven, uh, Nynaeve, Elaine, and eventually Brigitte are hiding out in the circus, and as part of their hiding out, they try to disguise themselves as best they can. Part of their disguise, they dye their hair. Elaine, Burkita, canonically blonde, no problems there. Nynaeve, <laughs> she is canonically a brunette. And, all right, okay, let me just back up a bit. I, as I've talked about before, I initially, of course, read these books, like physical paper copies of them, read them with my eyes. And uh, I apparently skimmed all of the physical descriptions when I did that. Not intentionally, it just, it turns out that I subconsciously just don't care what fictional characters really look like. It's not important to me, so I would see a physical description and my mind would just go, next, and I would skip. I did not know what a lot of the characters looked like until I listened to the audiobooks. And I first listened to them <laughs> while, oh god, this might be the most bougie thing I've ever said in my life. I first listened to the audiobooks while I was backpacking through Europe. Borrowed the CDs from the library, ripped them, put them on my iPod, like the old one with the, the click wheel. and. I'm, turns out I am much more of an auditory learner. I knew this, but this was one of those things that I, like, when I was listening to the audiobooks, the difference in level of detail that I picked up, it just made, slammed that home for me. Oh, this is how I learn. <laughs> I learn from listening. I, before listening to the audiobooks, had pictured Nynaeve as a, as a redhead. Like, she had been a vaguely female form with red hair, I guess, because she has a fiery personality. I don't know. And so I remember being shocked when to go, oh, God, she has brown hair. Wow. And, okay, I remember that I was in Venice when I got to Fires of Heaven. The reason I remember this is because I was holding, I was in a shop buying uh, one of those Venetian carnival masks. And I was holding a mask in my hand that was like a deep, shiny red color when the audiobooks mentioned that she had dyed her hair a brassy red. And I remember just staring at this mask thinking, she dyed her hair 
this color? What? I think because the fact that she was brunette was like, that, that fact was new to me, this jumped out at me. Brunettes can't just dye their hair a brassy red. Like, I have brown hair. I can easily dye my hair a darker brown. I could even dye my hair black. No problems there. I can tint it like a little bit with like a little bit of a red tint if I want. But if I want my hair to be a brassy red, I'd have to first lighten my hair, probably by bleaching it, and then dye it red. It is not something that can be done simply. Worse still, in the books, later on when they're on the boat, Elaine and Brigida wash the dye out of their hair. Again, fine, they can do that. Nynaeve also apparently somehow goes back to her natural color. You cannot undo lightening dark hair. You have stripped it of its melanin. It's impossible. If she wanted to have her brown hair again, she should have been continuously re-dyeing her hair until her roots had grown out long enough for her to do a chop and she could start again. So yeah, it's not exactly a plot hole. It's more just, that's not how hair works. Okay, <laughs> moving on from that, that point of inspiration to my next plot hole. The next one on my list comes from, I think it's The Great Hunt. Our crew is uh, in a steading and they are trying to negotiate a passage through the ways. And the Ogier are trying to dissuade them from doing this by bringing out an Ogier that had been touched by Mashadar. And Varen, who is an Aes Sedai, reaches out and she touches him and she can tell that he has no soul. What? This is a problem because, of course, in a steading, you do not have access to the One Power. You can't even sense it. You cannot channel in, in the steading. And I have read theories that what Varen did with this, uh, this Ogier was just, it's not a thing of the power, which I find really, really odd. Like, Varen can just sense souls. Can anyone do this? Like, is this a skill that anybody can learn? It seems like a very weird and specific skill that would only ever be applicable in this one situation. So how would anyone learn that they had this skill? How would... How would this come about? It's a very weird thing to have. The other theory that I've read is that Baron has a well, uh, you know, a terangrial that can contain a, a little bit of the one power that she can take into places like a setting. This one, I guess it could work, but it messes with my idea of what a setting is. In my mind, this is my headcanon, a setting is a sort of a pocket dimension from the Ogier's homeworld or, or home dimension. So... Again, just in my mind, the one power does not work there. And so a well wouldn't work either. But this, of course, is just, it's a headcanon thing. We also never see or hear about Varen having a well. And while she is a super secretive and mysterious person, we are with her when she's in places like Farm Adding. I'd imagine if she had a well, we'd have heard about it then. So it feels like a weird plot hole or, or plot inconsistency. Moving on. Next on my list is Ulrich, uh, specifically Ulrich's death. Uh, Ulrich was Swan's warder and he was killed during the coup in the Shadow Rising in the White Tower. Uh, Light and company, they burst into Swan's office, they shield her, they drag her out where she sees Ulrich, her warder, dead. And she did not feel it, was not even aware of it until she saw his body. The general fan consensus about this, at least the ones that I've come across, is that either A, she was just so shocked by what was happening with Elida and everybody that she just didn't notice him die, or B, that she couldn't feel it because she was shielded. The first explanation feels completely impossible to me. Ulrich died! I, I can't imagine being like psychically linked to another person so you can feel their sensations and emotions and be so distracted by something that you don't feel that person literally die. The second explanation, oh, it feels kind of like hand wavy to me, like a wizard did it. Although I guess in the story it is magic, so I guess a wizard did do it, but whatever. It feels hand wavy, it feels too convenient. We see people getting shielded all the time in this story, and we do not hear about the Aes Sedai or their warders suddenly losing a sense of, of where you know, they're what do you call it, their counterpart is, or whether they're alive or not anymore. Like, I, I don't think we do that. We hear about that, do we? Uh, but I guess like the Varen one, this can be hand-waved away. It's just that the hand-wavy explanation is not satisfying to me. Now, the next one on my list, no hand-waving. It's just, it's like the point that inspired this video. 
Okay, so the Aes Sedai, they have this uh, mental trick where they can ignore the weather, ignore the heat, ignore the cold. And more than that, uh, more than just ignoring it, they seem to be able to stop themselves from sweating. We know this because of Swan. Swan at one point remarks or thinks to herself that she envies the Aes Sedai, their ability to not sweat. Which, first of all, how? Like, she should still be able to do this. This is a mental trick. It's not supposed to be a thing of the power. Although, okay, it is a concentration trick, and so maybe she was just really stressed at that moment and couldn't do it. I don't know. Whatever. That's not even the point. <laughs> the point is, you need to sweat, or you'll die. <laughs> there are people in the world who can't sweat, and it is a life-threatening condition. You have to, like, a lot of them, uh, people, they wear, like, equipment to keep their bodies cool. Sweat serves a function, and without it, you can overheat and die. So all these Aes Sedai, and later on, all these Ashaman who are out there, and they're not sweating, so they look all calm and cool, they should have also all been falling off their horses and passing out due to heat stroke. Okay, and so now we come to what I think is the biggest plot hole, Asmodee. No, not who killed him, but, all right, let's get into it. In The Shadow Rising, we see Rand, with a little help from his ex, that he captures Asmodean and takes him on as a teacher. They are together throughout Fires of Heaven, and Rand is very, very mistrustful of him, even knowing the limitations that are put on Asmodean because of Lanfear's weird, like, shield timer thingy. Rand just doesn't trust Asmodean. And rightfully so. Asmodean is one of the Forsaken, a person who willingly forsake the light, forsook, the light, anyway, who gave his own mother to a murdral and who was likely done other horrible things that we never hear about. He's not a good guy, and Rand shouldn't trust him. Then, Asmodian disappears without a trace, and Rand just doesn't care. He isn't worried about him. He doesn't constantly wonder if or where this man is, this man who is evil to his core and who got a long prolonged, drawn-out peek behind the curtain. A man who, because of being by Rand's side for so long, understands him better than any of the other Forsaken. The other Forsaken, they might know Luz Theron, Asmodian knows Rand. And therefore, Asmodian would be more able to predict Rand's behavior. Asmodian literally taught him how to channel, and therefore would know his areas of weakness. This man, whose ability is supposed to return to full strength, after, you know, an undetermined period of time, he vanishes without a trace, and Rand is just like, this is fine? This, to me, is the biggest plot hole in the story. Realistically, Rand should have been paranoid about Asmodian. All the things we see him actually being paranoid about, this is one that he absolutely should have been obsessed over. But I'm pretty sure I know why he wasn't. It's because of us. Us, the readers. We know that Asmodian is dead. We know that he was Balefard. He can't even be brought back. So for us, reading about Rand focusing on the possible threat that Asmodian could be would just be frustrating and annoying. It would feel like, like wasted page time. But in world, it doesn't make any, any sense at all. Until Luz Theron starts, you know, feeding and downloading information into Rand, Asmodian pretty much taught him everything he knows about the one power. Asmodian knows who he trusts and who he doesn't, who his friends are, ha has seen him plan things out. He knows what triggers Rand. He is such a huge threat, even without his ability to channel. And the fact that he disappeared without a trace kind of would make me, if I was Rand, suspect that, oh, his ability to channel returned. So that would compound his threat even more. And Rand just seems to forget about him. Plot hole. But okay, that's it. For a 15-book series, this short of a list, to me, is incredibly impressive, especially given that out of my list, only one of them feels really serious, and even that one, I kind of get why it exists. How about you? Do you see any plot holes that I missed? Uh, let me know in the comments below, or come join my Discord. It's a great platform for just nerding out over <laughs> our love of these books. And if you like my content, please check out my Patreon. I... I absolutely adore all of my patrons, you guys. You absolutely rock. And with that, I will end here. As always, like, subscribe, and stick around for the art credits. Bye!